It's time for another edition of Lewis at Large, 60 minutes of smart talk radio featuring guests from all walks of life in conversation with your host, Warner Lewis. So sit back and lend us your ears for the next hour. Now here with today's first guest is the host of Lewis at Large, Warner Lewis. Well, welcome everybody to another edition of Lewis at Large. Here's truly Warner Lewis from the flight deck and of course some smart Talk radio will be withheld within this interview, and uh, this uh, one will be certainly no exception. We're going to be talking uh, with General Ann Dunwoody. Who is Ann Dunwoody? She's the first woman to become a four-star general in the United States Army. She is now retired, uh, but she is a sought-after public speaker. She's the president of the First of Four LLC. It's a leadership mentoring and strategic advisory services company. She serves on the board of directors for L3 Communications for Public Services and Logistics Management Institute. She's also a member of the Leadership Council for the Aspen Institute's Franklin Project uh, and much, much more. We are very excited to have her here, General Ann Dunwoody. Do I call you General? Do I call you Ann? Do I call you Miss Dunwoody? What works with you? Anything you'd like, Warner. Okay, okay. <laughs> What's ever easy. <laughs> All right. Well, we're we're so excited to have you here. Uh, there, again, uh, and your purpose here is is simple. You have a brand new work called "A Higher Standard: Leadership Strategies from America's First Female Four Star General." Let's do this. Let's share with our listeners. Uh, how did Ann Dunwoody uh, get into the United States military? Give us a little bit about that, and what was it about the military that was attractive to you? Okay, well, I, I, I came from a military background, four generations of West Pointers in my family, but in spite of that, I never dreamed of coming into the military. Growing up, I knew I was going to be a phys ed teacher and a coach. I was a little tomboy, athlete, loved sports, and everything I did in my life was geared to training, teaching, and preparing me to be a coach and a phys ed teacher, to include the college that I went to in upstate New York, sunny Cortland, which was one of the top ten phys ed schools back then. And so that was my passion. That was my dream. Now, in my junior year in college, which was 1974, uh, kind of winding down Vietnam era, the Army was trying to recruit women into the Army, and they had a program that if you were selected, they paid you $500 a month during your senior year in college. You have a two-year commitment, and you are commissioned as a second lieutenant. Now, this was before they had ROTC for women, before West Point was open to women, so it was a new program. And I really had to think hard about that. Uh, $500 was a lot of money back then, 500 bucks a month. And so I decided that, you know, I could do anything for two years, and it might be a fun experience. I enjoyed being an Army brat growing up in the Army. And then it would just be a little short two-year detour into my teaching and coaching profession. That was the start of my Army <laughs> career. And you were, uh, and again, you talked about uh, your junior year in 1974. Uh, that was smack dab uh, in the middle of quite a few things. Vietnam, obviously, and there was the whole attitude on an American college campus towards ROTC, towards those things, was very, very negative for the most part at the time. Did, did you feel yourself ever battling that, or like you were running upstream, or was it something that came pretty natural? You know, I, it's probably one of the reasons that I really didn't think about going into the military, uh, because you saw the battle, you saw the Vietnam, you saw what was going on, and, you know, it just... It, it wasn't something that said, boy, I want to go do that. I, I want to go coach and teach. But the reality was because there was no ROTC on campus where I went to school, uh, I didn't witness any of that. I only saw what I saw on TV. But I, So I never uh, battled uh, that. And I did my friends, those coming back from the war, uh, wearing uniforms, getting spat on and spit on and called names. Yeah. And that, that was a horrible time for our country and for our men and women in uniform. Yeah. And what, uh, again, as, as you made this decision, uh, there are obviously a lot of parallels between uh, military service and the disciplines required there and those required a lot of times at the higher level of sports. I, I assume you saw a lot of those parallels. It must have been a tough decision at the very end. Uh, you know, it, what I, it was kind of an epiphany for me, Warner, that my dream of being a coach and a phys ed teacher uh, was my, being my passion 
ended up still being my dream and my passion. I just ended up doing it in a different classroom and a different battlefield and a different profession. The military is all about teaching, coaching. It's very physically demanding. And so a door I walked into to try it out turned out to be something I was as passionate about as anything I dreamed about growing up. What about the, and let's, uh, there, there's so much to talk about with you. And again, we're with General Ann Dunwoody, now retired, but she was America's first four-star uh, general, first four-star female general. Uh, and again, now retired, we're talking about a brand new war called A Higher Standard, Leadership Strategies from America's First Female Four-Star General. My sense is that you're not thinking, you don't think of yourself as a male or a female, you think of yourself as United States citizen first. But but tell us a little bit at the time, uh, being America's first female four-star general, what kind of feelings did you have and did you how significant is it to you that you're female versus male so to speak in this particular role when i rewind the video in my mind of the day of my nomination and then of my promotion i i am flooded with the same emotions as if i was standing at the podium that day and it was just one of such humility and pride and honor to think about receiving the nation's first nomination for this prestigious job. And I'd had a lot of firsts in my life, Warner, first female platoon leader, first that, because we began the integration of women into the military. But I wasn't prepared for this first. It was a different first. And when the cards and letters, and I'm Duffel bags, you can the duffel bags full of letters from boys and girls and moms and dads and, and veterans and people around the world just saying how happy they were that this moment had finally arrived and that they could tell their daughters that they could be anything they want to be to include a four star general in the United States military, something I couldn't even have fathomed growing up. What about it again? I know you get asked this a lot, but uh, let's let's do it one more time. What about again because of the career that you've had and the perspective that you've had in the United States and around the world? Tell us about your feelings about women in direct combat. Uh, yeah, I have been asked about it a lot, and I I think in some ways the policy is finally catching up with reality of today's warfare. And unlike the day, old days when we really were on a linear battlefield where all the fighting and combat arms were up front and the tanks and the infantry and the combat support folks like myself, service support, we were back in the rear pushing supplies forward. Those days have are gone. 9-11 changed all that. And now we're in an asymmetrical environment, uh, asymmetrical battlefield, where every soldier is a rifleman first. Cities are war zones. You know, uh, bakeries are war zones. It, uh, dining facilities are war zones. Convoys are threatened by ambush and IEDs. So it's a very different battlefield out there and a very dangerous one, and it's not just in countries. It's, it's globally. And so this whole mindset that soldiers have got to be able to defend and protect themselves first regardless of their profession if as a logistician i had to be able to protect myself in today's environment so did the men and women who work for me and we had to invest in the training of that new mindset that it's just not the guys at the pointy end of the spear anymore it's everyone that's out there on that battlefield and when i came through they just started letting women go to airborne school, women officers. And I thought, wow, you know, phys ed major, I love doing all that stuff. They're going to teach me how to jump out of an airplane. Well, that policy change didn't necessarily change the mindsets or biases or prejudices that exist out there. It wasn't, oh, boy, let's let women jump out of airplanes with us. And so, like everything, it takes time, evolution, and transformation for women to have the opportunity to demonstrate that they're fully capable, they can do that, they're value-added, and that they're professionals. And now they just celebrated, I think, the 40th anniversary of women in airborne, airborne instructor, airborne pilots, airborne jump masters, airborne jumpers. You, you don't even think about that door opening. And here we are, fast forward now to 2015, and they're looking at combat arms 
open to women. And, and my take is this is an evolution and another door opening, but it's, it's one that's catching up with the reality of today's warfare. And I never wanted to be a ranger or infantry. I wanted to be a paratrooper <laughs> and jump out of airplanes. But there are women today who believe and want to be in these specialties, be rangers, be SEALs, go through these leadership courses and, and get that badge. And Ann Dunwoody's take is that if they are fully capable, if they can meet those standards, and we should not by any means lower the standards to accommodate this, if they can meet or exceed those standards, they should have the opportunity. That was a long answer to your short question. No, no, no. It's a good one indeed, and you're right. The world is a much different place now. But let's uh, let's focus now on higher standard. Uh, again, after all that you've done, all the all the work that you've done, and the achievements that 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 you were able to do throughout your career and all the travel, did you feel like you wanted to rest, or did you feel like, hey, I got to write a book? <laughs> Writing a book was the last thing on my mind. <laughs> well, tell us, tell us about that. Again, obviously, you learned so much, uh, sort of blazing the trail and doing the work that you did. But tell us about the motivation behind the book. I really didn't think about writing the book, but so many people start asking, when's your book coming out, and when are you going to tell your story? And the more I thought about it, I, I've had a wonderful journey, and I have a wonderful story to tell, and it's one that needs telling. And I'm sure, as you can imagine, many people in their mind, they thought, well, how did you claw your way to the top in this male-dominated army? And and it wasn't like that at all. It was a journey more about leadership than gender. And so I didn't want to write a book, a memoir, or a diary, or you know, how to become a general. I don't know if I could even write that book. But leadership lessons and strategies that worked for me as I was coming up through the ranks uh, and that I hope could work for other people, whether they're in small business in the military or just deciding what they want to be when they grow up. So my motivation was to share the lessons that worked for me, inspire people to dream big and find ways to make a difference. Well, there's several things that that jump out as you as you go through this book. Number one, thank you for not including out of focus photographs of you with some bad celebrity somewhere. We, see, we get some of those sometimes. But anyway, this is a very real real look uh, at leadership. And uh, one of the ones that I noticed, there's several I want to talk to you about, but one is called "Never Walk by a Mistake." Expound on that if you would. My very first platoon sergeant, Sergeant First Class Wendell Bowen. Uh, when I was at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and Second Lieutenant Ann Dunwoody reported in for duty. Uh, in the military, your platoon sergeant really is your first coach and mentor, and he'll take a little butter bar like I was and train you uh, how to be a lieutenant. And I didn't just have a good non-commissioned officer. I had the best non-commissioned officer, and that was Sergeant Bowen. He'd been to Vietnam. It was a broken army, but there's nothing broken about him. And he told me he was going to make me the best platoon leader, not the best female platoon leader, but the best platoon leader in the Army. He taught me what right looked like. And one of his very basic principles was to never walk by a mistake. And if you walk by a mistake, you just set a new lower standard. And when you think about it, it sounds easy, but it's really hard to do all the time. Whether you see trash on the ground, you don't pick it up, whether a soldier's not wearing his headgear and you don't correct him, or whether he's not maintaining his weapon to standard, it's a slippery slope. And once you let those standards slide, all of a sudden the discipline, which the military's founded on, starts slipping in the organization, is not living to the standards of which that uniform we're wearing says we represent. What about, here's another one uh, that I thought was very, very interesting, leveraging the power of diversity. Tell us about that. Um, I did enter, and uh, when I came in the Army, it was the Women's Army Corps still, and so that was kind of a, a, a separate army for the women who desired to serve, and then that was disestablished, and then we began the integration. Well, as you can imagine, I... I never worked for a female because there weren't any, and uh, we were all beginning this journey at the same time. So I worked for men who either believed in me or who didn't, and most importantly for me, I had a lot of advocates in my life. And as we began that that journey (laughs) of... 
lost my question there. <laughs> well, we were, we were talking about leveraging the power of diversity. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. As we're going through there, they're obviously mostly a male-dominated uh, profession. But what I realized is that as as you had questions and issues, the more people inclusive that you could involve in decision-making process and come to solutions, that the better your result would be. And when I say people from all walks of life, I mean just that. And you get different perspectives. If you surround yourself with people who look, think, and act like you, you're probably going to get similar uh, answers that you might have yourself. And so as throughout my journey, what I try to do was bring in people, the best and brightest from all walks of life, to bring the leverage, the power, diversity of thought to these very complex solutions. What about, uh, and again, as, as you as you wrote this book, uh, I'm curious, you were drawing on your life experiences. Was there any, any particular one incident that you feel defined your career over all the years that you were in the, in, in the military? That's a tough one, I know, but it was, was there an incident or a period of time that, that you reflect on and think, wow, that was a big turning point for me? Yeah, I think it would, uh, and you're right, it's a tough one, because I've had a lot of inflection points in my life, and probably those things that just keep you going and keep you climbing. But I think in the 82nd Airborne Division, which was the all-American division, the pre- one of the premier divisions in my mind to ever get assigned to, and here I finally got into the division. I was the only female field grade major at the time in the division, and I started out and not so hot job, not a glamorous job, and I just figured, well, okay, they don't really know what to do with me, but I'm going to get in here, do my best, and hopefully they'll recognize that I'm capable of doing better things. And and that's what happened during my time in the 82nd. I think it really was my four years with the division ultimately led to my commanding a battalion in the 82nd Airborne Division. It's probably the best job I ever had. And one of the, if I never did another thing in the Army, I thought, I have commanded a battalion in the 82nd Airborne Division. I have arrived. <laughs> that must have. What about also, let's talk, because uh, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the specifics in the book, but let's talk about uh, your career and, and its impact, good, maybe, and negative, so to speak, or challenges for your family. Um, yeah, that's the military is a very demanding profession, and we talk about uh, work-life balance and you know keeping all the balance in your life. But when you're, uh, especially in the military at war, the demands of that military are extreme. My husband and I got married in uh, say 25 years ago, and our first 10 years of marriage, he was in the Air Force and I was in the Army, and we were separated. Uh, five of those 10 years, he was commanding Air Force units at different bases, and I was commanding Army units at separate bases. And, you know, we think he, he we loved each other. He loved the Air Force. I loved the Army. We made it work. But it's hard, and you have to be committed and dedicated uh, to both your family and your service. But finding that balance is very, very hard and challenging. Again, we're with uh, Ann Dunwoody here on Lewis at Large. Here's truly Warner Lewis from the flight deck. Ann is the first woman to become a four-star general in the United States Army. She is now happily retired with her family down in Florida, uh, but a brand-new work called A Higher Standard Leadership Strategies from America's First Female Four-Star General. What about also the concept of recognizing your advocates, your patronizers, and your detractors? Uh, like, expand on that, if you would, a little bit. <laughs> Now, could you relate to that in your life? Uh, yes, I can. Yes, I can. <laughs> you know, and I think it's in every profession. And I, I talk about I, uh, one thing I didn't want to do is, you know, I, I didn't want to be a gossipy book. I didn't want to be one that threw people under the bus. I wanted to identify uh, leadership styles that I ran into along my journey. And there's bumps in the road, there's obstacles in the road, and there's also advocates and people that help you along the way. And I think that's in every profession. And so I chose to call them advocates, which are, are people who recognize you, believe in you, and go out of their way as they're watching you to coach and mentor you. And then there's 
patronizers, and again, I think these exist in every profession, people that are nice to you when you're talking to them face-to-face, and then when they go behind the scenes, they're figuring out your demise. And then there's people that just don't like you. They might think this is all men's army, and we don't need women in there, and there's nothing you can do. They don't like, you're not good or bad. They just don't like you. But my lesson to the to the reader and the thing I learned was regardless of who you're dealing with, you have to stay on the moral high ground. You have to keep on demonstrating you're the best of the best, that you're credible, you stay professional, you stay fair, you don't stoop to name-calling, you don't stoop to innuendos and trying to trick the tricks. So uh, that worked for me. And many times you can convert patronizers or detractors by staying on the moral high ground. This seems almost sort of simplistic, I guess, to ask you at this point after all this time, but uh, expand, if you would, a little bit on your view of the whole issue of gays in the military. I know you've been asked that before as well, but I would like to hear it. Um, I've watched in my four decades uh, the military being a leader of the embracing, and this I I say it's part of the diversity. When you think about the integration of blacks into the military, how long that took, how painful that was. But the military was probably the first to do that as long as it took, as hard as it was, but we're there. And then it was women into the military. And again, a transformation, an evolution that took a long time. And then gays, the embracing of talent. It's, again, sometimes the policies keeping up with the reality of people. And that's looking at people and leveraging them and valuing them for who they are, face value, and how how they contribute. And so, again, the military, first don't ask, don't tell, and then the repeal, a leader of the embracing of blacks, women, gays into the military, and the doors continue to open. What about, uh, again, you four-plus decades uh, in the Army, uh, rising to its highest ranks, and now a book. So are you ever going to go lay by a beach, or what are you going to do next? <laughs> <laughs> I live in Tampa, okay. <laughs> right, on the, Good right spot. on the water here. And, uh, this, is, uh, I, I say, this, is, this is probably the hardest thing I ever did, was write this book, because I never dreamed how hard it was going to be. I thought you, you hire someone, you do some inter- hours of interviews, and they write something, you edit it, and voila. But the reality is, if if you want a book to be in your voice, through your eyes, through your you know experiences, there's only one person that can do that. And of course, with my husband's help, and that's you. And so, it's taken a good chunk of our life <laughs> to put this thing together and write something that we're really happy with and and pleased with. And so now, you're right. Time to enjoy, but share the experiences and hopefully inspire others to be the best they can be in whatever they decide to do. Are you traveling a lot, or are you, are you just done? T- are you tired of traveling, <laughs> ready to just kind of sit tight for a while? No, actually, I'm traveling to some prettier places in Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah, <I'll bet> you. <laughs> no, and I'm on several boards, which are exciting to me because you continue to learn uh, new businesses and a totally different environment. It's a lot of fun. Kind of want to wrap up here, and and really, just you had just mentioned uh, your tour of duty. Uh, we were part of many tours of duty over Iran and Iraq, and all those. I'm just curious, as as you have wound down your military career, and you look back on it, and tell us right now, in terms of the world, how how well positioned are we militarily, from your opinion, uh, the U.S. Whether it's the Army, the entire arm, United States Armed Forces, how safe, so to speak, are we? I think uh, you see this cycle, and this is the frustrating piece for me, and it's also part of the military part I don't miss being there, and that's this budget cycle where you see at the height of every conflict all kinds of money, everything you need, everything you want, and then toward first even sign of we're ending conflict, the budget gets drastically cut. And we've always had a second and third order effect of that, whether it was the hollow army after Vietnam that took 10 years to recover, Task Force Smith into Korea, an untrained, unready task force going in. It was a disaster. And here we are again, slashing budgets drastically and dramatically 
uh, and if you can't do it methodically, there's there's huge uh, challenges with the efficiencies of way you can manage a drawdown to stay ready. And of course, when you look at the world as you do, it's more dangerous than I have ever seen. It is more dangerous than, uh, and it's scary to me uh, that we're not investing more in our military. Well, that's probably another entire show in and of itself. But uh, again, the work is called A Higher Standard uh, by General Ann Dunwoody. Uh, She has been our guest, uh, and we are very, very pleased to have had her. The work uh, is published by DeCapo Press. Uh, Ann, how can people get a copy of the book? And also, do you have a website where you have material as well? I do. Uh, it's on Amazon.com in every version you can imagine. I have an com, which uh, talks about the book. You can order through that as well. And I don't know if there's, you can get it on Kindle, you can get it on audio, and you can get it in the bookstores. Lots of different ways these days to get a hold of material. Well, listen again, uh, uh, Anne. Again, I, should, I feel like I should call you General Dunwoody, but who? No, Anne is fine. Uh, Anne, <laughs> it's thank my you. new life. <laughs> thank you so much for your service. Enjoy your retirement, and uh, uh, look forward to uh, a lot of people getting a hold of this. It really is a, a quality uh, book on leadership. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I truly enjoyed it. What a treat. You bet. We will be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large.